Good morning, everyone. Welcome to a, another United States Study Center webinar. I'm Simon Jackman, Professor of Political Science at the University of Sydney and the CEO of the United States Study Center. And the United States Study Center, when we're at the United States Study Center physically, stands, as does the University of Sydney, on the traditional lands of the Gadigal people uh, who form part of the Eora Nation. And we pay our respects uh, to elders past, present and emerging. Um, it is June 30 here in Australia, uh, halfway through a, a tumultuous 2020. Look, I just, before we get started today, I just want to thank everybody who's been regularly attending these webinars at this halfway point uh, through the year. Um, if these were physical events, you'd all be seeing one another regularly in the audience and, and perhaps forming a little bit of connection and community that way. Um, but we are seeing on our end with the, through the registration process, uh, tons of repeat traffic, um, lots of people coming back multiple times uh, for, for this series of talks and, and webinars we're, we're hosting. So thank you from everybody at the US Study Center for your interest in our work and in the mission of the center I just thought it'd be appropriate to, to point that out, um, just um, how big the total audience is over this series of webinars, numbering well into past 5,000, 6,000 unique views, perhaps even seven or 8,000 um, um, uh, uh, so separate views, but unique individuals in, 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 the, in the several thousands as well, two, 3,000 uh, people uh, cumulatively, unique individuals have, have tuned into these. So thank you so much. If these were in-person events, they would be very large events. And, and it's just one of the things that, you know, these adverse circumstances give us this opportunity um, to reach um, an audience larger than we might otherwise. And the other thing these events do is, is allow us to engage with individuals in the United States that we might not otherwise. It would be a very expensive proposition in uh, flying some of the amazing people we've had the pleasure of talking to. Uh, to Australia and, 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 and all that goes with that. But everybody's been so uh, good spirited and generous with their time in these circumstances. And, and that includes uh, today's guest, uh, uh, David Kilcullen, uh, who's a, a longtime expatriate Australian, uh, now based in the United States, but um, holds an affiliation back here in Australia as Professor of International and Political Studies at the University of New South Wales, their Canberra campus. Uh, and he is also a professor of practice in global security at Arizona State University. Now, now David's career, if you don't know, uh, is a particularly fascinating one. David begins life in the Australian Army um, and, and becomes um, one of our leaders uh, with respect to doctrine, um, with respect to uh, uh, guerrilla warfare, uh, terrorism and counter-terrorism, -terror um, urban conflict and, and, and the future of conflict. Uh, and between his service in uniform and then as a civilian serving both Australian and, and the United States governments, uh, that's 25 years of public service um, between the two countries in, in, a, in a variety of different roles. But um, I first got to know about David, uh, his service um, during the Iraq conflict uh, when he was serving in Baghdad as a member of the Joint Strategic Assessment Team and then um, as senior counterinsurgency advisor to the multinational task force in Iraq, and then going on to be special advisor for counterinsurgency to U.S. Secretary of State uh, Condi Rice, uh, my former colleague from Stanford. And in 2009, um, David was named as one of foreign policy's top 100 global thinkers. Uh, he went on to serve alongside um, some of my former students from Stanford, who on a, on a not dissimilar career trajectory, academic, in uniform, but uh, getting PhDs and then going on to serve in leadership roles and, and bringing truly innovative sort of mindset and tools uh, uh, from, the, from, the, from academia to bear on a very complicated uh, mission, um, uh, that is uh, counterinsurgency. Uh, in an environment like, um, like Afghanistan, perhaps in particular. So that's how I got to know about David's career. And then fast forward the tape, um, I, wanna, I wanna bring up real quickly, I'll just screen share with you if I can. Um, and I'll have to just get my act together to do that. An article that, that David had in the Australian um, about a month ago now, and, and, and there it is there, if I've, if I've pressed all the right buttons. 
Um, this is not <laughs> about counterinsurgency, uh, and, and, but it, it's about a not unrelated topic, shall we say, and that is um, um, the, 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 the threat, at least, for uh, uh, civil unrest in the United States. And, and this is a, a fascinating piece and totally consistent with the, with the way I know David and his ilk go about uh, their work, empirically rich and very close to the data, um, making a very compelling case. And there you see um, a map um, and, and naming names and really doing the hard yards on understanding what the lay of the land is here, as, as, as this map indicates, the potential flashpoints in the US. And, and that, I thought, would be a great kickoff point for a conversation with David, someone I've always wanted to have a chat with. And it turns out, as I said earlier, adversity uh, driving opportunity. It turns out that these are the circumstances. Uh, uh, David, thanks for joining us from the United States. Thanks, Matt. Great to be here. That's Very terrific. Um, and, and I should point out, David, it's, it's a little bit later than usual. David's at the end of a, of a big a bit of cross-country moving at the moment, and we especially appreciate him giving up his time um, late in the evening uh, there in the United States tonight. Hey, David, I thought, as, as we discussed uh, planning this event out, we would throw it over to you, and I'll stop the screen share now so we can do that. Um, we'll throw it over to you uh, for some opening remarks uh, before, um, you know, I, I turn us to some Q&A and we've got some excellent questions from the floor already that, that we'll get to. But, but with that, David, thank you so much and over to you. Yeah, thanks, Simon. Um, well, so I'm sure you, there's a lot of expertise on the call and I'm sure that people will have particular questions they want to pursue. So what I thought I'd do is just open up with about, you know, 15 or 20 minutes of just sort of concentrated remarks on this issue of unrest in the United States. Um, I don't normally touch US domestic politics, um, partly because I, I think it's bad for someone who is data driven to take sides in this extremely partisan, um, very toxic debate that goes on in the US. So I try to sort of stick to the facts wherever possible. Secondly, uh, and by no means um, least important, I'm technically the military correspondent for the Australian and there is a US political correspondent and there's turf issues if I start getting into <laughs> uh, their area. So I, I try to stay away from this sort of political bit. But this time, my editor sort of um, imposed on me to, uh, to, to write something. And I'd actually been writing in April. And it came out in May, just as the whole George Floyd situation right. kicked off. So what I thought I'd do is, is talk a little bit about um, some of the ideas that are in that piece. Uh, some of the background to it, which I didn't put in the piece. And then I want to talk about, um, you know, what I got wrong uh, okay. and what I got right that was sort of exposed about 24 hours after the piece came out, which I think was quite interesting. Let me share my screen. I want to just um, give you uh, a couple of things to think about. And it's probably easier to do that um, uh, by, by showing the screen. I tend to think about background trends and think about what impact they have on the environment and then use that as a way of framing the analysis because there's so many things to look at if you're just driven by what's fashionable in the news, you can be skewed. I know this is a bit of an eye chart, but let me just summarize it. In the political angle, we've seen a collapse of confidence in elites, establishments and institutions. I think that very much explains the election of Donald Trump in 2016. That's been combined with a collapse of the political center, negative polarization, and just this incredibly toxic partisan hypocrisy um, of people on the, in the establishment on both sides of politics, which has led to a rise of populists on left and right. Trump, but not only Trump, on the right, and the whole Bernie Sanders um, AOC coalition on the left. This is not unconnected with the public's war weariness after 20 years of inconclusive and or failed foreign wars, uh, even as su supposed experts keep telling them they have the best military in history, but they see that military struggling 
in Iraq and Afghanistan and elsewhere. On the military side, um, the main point relevant to, to this discussion is that a lot of the things that we have been doing overseas in the past 20 years have come home to roost in the US in terms of technology, uh, techniques, grievances, um, the approximately 3 million US combat veterans who've returned to a country where 41% of people either own a weapon or live with someone who does, um, with significant experience in both rural and urban guerrilla conflict. And those people are not overwhelmingly on the right, they're, they're on all sides of politics. Um, of course, we've also seen a return of great power armed confrontation, um, although mostly right now hybrid and unconventional rather than conventional. On the economic side, you know, for 20 years we've seen Sinocentric economic globalization, but US centric political globalization, and both of those now are on fairly rickety foundations. Um, a number of issues in the economy, which we can come back to talk about, but you know, financialization, specialization, just in time logistics, offshoring, outsourcing, labor cost arbitrage, which pushed a lot of jobs um, overseas, the collapse of what the economist Graham Summers calls the everything bubble um, after 2008, and the, the Great Depression 2.0 that we're starting to see. Um, rising inequality and populist rage, which taps into that political discussion at the beginning. Um, and then just a string of crises. And the other point that I want to highlight is informational. Um, in the year 1974 alone, there were 2,000 domestic bombings in the United States, an incredibly high level of military style violence, politically motivated in the immediate aftermath of the Vietnam War. There is actually far less violence happening now, but we have a social media network and a conventional media model that really emphasizes and amplifies that level of violence so that it has a significant political impact out of proportion to the reality. Um, perhaps the best writer on this is a guy called uh, Matt Tavey, who used to write for Rolling Stone, wrote a book called Hate Inc. Uh, last year, basically explaining how it's the media's economic business model that actually drives a lot of what's going on here. And that means we can't just wake up and shake ourselves and decide to be less partisan. Uh, reality is kind of a non-overlapping Venn diagram now where people are in different bubbles. So that was the situation, you know, when the coronavirus hit. Uh, and in the business, we call these kinds of events complex emergencies. We have a combination of a public health or humanitarian issue with a economic crisis and then a security crisis, which makes it hard to deal with the first two. So if you think about the sort of first wave, we're now into the second wave um, of COVID and of course the US is the worst hit country in the world if you believe everyone's data. Um, I've marked the second wave as less severe in health terms than the first, but we don't really know that yet. It could actually turn out to be significantly worse. The second wave is the economic impact. 40 million people um, out of work since 12 weeks ago, uh, collapse in what was one of the best job markets uh, in history for African Americans uh, in particular, a wave of bankruptcies, about 140,000 small and medium businesses have gone out of business since uh, March. We are just beginning to see the, uh, uh, what I think is gonna be a wave of, of uh, municipal bankruptcies in the second half of the year, as cities are just unable to um, fund themselves given the fact that they've had a massive collapse in tax revenue since March. And then we've begun to see the security crisis, a human security crisis generated by the economic impact, leading to internal unrest now. And I argue in a number of pieces that I've written recently, it's going to result in international or transnational security issues. Um, we're already seeing that in Africa and Latin America. We've seen it a lot in the Middle East. Uh, we've seen it on the Chinese and Indian border. Um, we are almost certainly gonna see some kind of uh, attempt by governments that are currently being blamed by their people to redirect that blame outward by scapegoating other countries. And unfortunately for the US, if you look at the peak compound impact of all those three 
waves. It's right around the end of this year, which means it'll coincide with probably one of the most violently contested presidential elections in living memory in the US. So that, that's sort of the, the overall situation. Um, I'm gonna stop sharing, but we can come back to any of these details uh, if people want. Just to point out that you know, people don't think this is a real economic crisis. They blame the government. They see it as a government imposed shutdown and power grab. Uh, and the government is in a double bind. If it shuts down or reshuts down in this case, uh, millions more people will be out of work and people will blame the government and claim that it was an overreaction. If it doesn't shut down, you know, there's already 127,000 deaths in the US. There could be two or three times that many by the end of the year and government will be blamed for that. So it's kind of a damned if you do, damned if you don't scenario for the federal, uh, state and some local governments. Um, we're dealing with a comp complex, pretty crowded conflict ecosystem. Red uh, groups on the left, yellow groups on the right. There are a number of groups that don't quite fit that framework. Jihadists, um, identitarian groups like Nation of Islam, a number of so-called accelerationist groups that are um, e ecological in orientation. And then um, most people don't include these in the, uh, in the analysis, but I actually think they're very important. There are a number of non-political or politically opportunistic groups that are out there that could potentially form what we call uh, conflict entrepreneurs uh, in the event of a conflict. So a big prepper and survivalist community, significant number of community self-defense groups. There's an incredibly robust tactical services industry, you know, 20,000 small businesses across the country that have a strong economic interest in training and selling weapons and getting people to be preppers and all that kind of stuff. And then a lot of criminal uh, gang and cartel activity associated with that. Um, won't go through this in detail, I'm gonna stop sharing now. Um, we can walk through this series of events if you want, but you can go back to the early 1990s and you see an escalating series of events um, often described as a rise of hate groups, uh, but I think that's not quite the right way to think about it. Um, the emphasis on hate uh, leads people to overstate the role of white wing groups in the problem set. Uh, actually, we've seen a very substantial rise in right wing hate, but the literature is very clear on this and our experience in the Middle East and Africa and Latin America is equally clear. What drives the most intense violence in a conflict isn't hate, it's fear. When people fear other groups in society, when they believe that those groups are encroaching on their territory, and when they lose faith in the government as an impartial actor that can keep them safe, that's when you start to see people engaging in incredibly vicious violence. And that's partly why I'm sort of blowing the whistle now. I think that we have to wake up and realize how close we are to the precipice of actually quite serious violence at the end of this year, coming from both left and right. Uh, and if we don't wake up to that, I think it's gonna be incredibly difficult to prevent it from happening. Now I can, sh I can share much more detail about any of that stuff that people wanna pick up, but let me stop there um, and throw back to you, um, Simon, and perhaps we can, we, you probably have a few questions before we get into yeah, it. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Um, that, that was great, thank you. David, um, wow. Um, <laughs> um, you did say in your remarks just then um, the probability of a violently contested election. Yeah. Uh, um, I, 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 I'm, I'm assuming you chose your words quite deliberately uh, yeah. there. Um, yeah. um, what do you see as the things governments can be doing now perhaps to, to stop that? I mean, you mentioned fear, but then a loss of confidence in the state as a guarantor of, of, um, yeah. of, of social stability. And what, what are the things that governments in the United States, and governments plural, um, by the way, the state and local is absolutely mm -hmm. implicated, perhaps even more than state, uh, federal government. What are the things they can be doing perhaps to head this off? So I think one of the things that we should be doing, in fact, is to focus on local 
and state level issues more so than federal. One of the problems in US politics is a sort of expansion of the federal discourse to shape everything at the state and local level. So, you know, there's um, almost laughable degree of um, hypocrisy on the part of major media outlets such as the New York Times, which um, went from blaming all public assembly and calling people murderers to suddenly praising public assemblies in the event of uh, the George Floyd process to turning again on a dime to now blame uh, reopening and uh, tarring every Republican state as bad and every Democrat state as good. If you look at Fox News, you see the exact same picture, but in reverse, right? Republicans good, Democrats bad, um, protesters bad, you know, and it, it's almost like whatever one side likes, the other side has to hate. And actually, the you know, I just drove through uh, nine US states in the last week. Um, you can see an incredible degree of variety in terms of state responses. It doesn't actually track um, Republican or Democrat. It actually has a lot more to do with degree of urbanization and uh, with population density and population makeup, right? And, you know, the states are incredibly diverse. And one of the adaptive strengths of the US system is that you know, if you don't want to live like people in New York, you don't have to be there. You can go to Southern Texas. And yep. if you think people in Southern Texas are ignorant rednecks, okay, move to San Francisco, right? You don't have to, um, you know, it's not a one size fits all, but the federal discourse has really expanded across. I think um, really, you know, the, the, the most important thing is going to be how cities and states handle the reopening and the potential for a subsequent lockdown in the second part of the year. Uh, some states are doing a great job with trying to contain and trace and um, do sort of a not immediately go back to a, a full scale lockdown if something breaks out again. Others are not. Uh, and I, I actually, I can show you my map later, but I, I, the map that I put into the, um, into the article in the Oz uh, was followed, of course, by major uh, conflicts the week after. So I have a map showing where those conflicts were. And I called some of it right, but some of it wrong. And if you do look at it, it's really overlapping zones of control of different political oriented armed groups right. and degree of, 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 um, of urbanization. Um, I think if you wanted to show us that map, um, yeah, me, now would be a great time. I yeah, think yeah. it follows on pretty um, neatly from that last question. Yeah. Um, so this is the, the map which my um, my folks at the Oz slightly butchered and put Appalachia down in Florida, but that's okay. Um, <laughs> basically, what I did here was I used the um, used the maps that um, the left wing groups have of where their organisations are, approximately fifty uh, of them. With and I used the maps that right wing militias have as to where they are, approximately three eighty of those groups. I um, uh, discounted any groups that don't actually carry military grade weapons, right? Um, and I mapped any area of influence where a group that has military grade weapons on the left is within 25 miles or an easy out and back drive from a group that's on the right. And hmm. you see a number of major cities, um, uh, Seattle and Portland on the, on the West Coast, whole region around um, uh, the inland part of Northern California, San Diego, uh, Southern Arizona around Phoenix. There's a whole area called the Northwest Redoubt, which is a right wing militia area, an area called the Southern Border Zone, where you have both left and right groups. A couple of diff distinct areas in, in Texas, Odessa and Austin, uh, the city of Denver in Colorado. Hmm. You might actually say the front range urban area because it's a single conurbation from Colorado Springs up to um, Fort Collins, but that's one, basically. 80% of the population of Colorado lives in a fairly dense urban area that's actually contested. The area of the Kansas-Missouri border, uh, Milwaukee, Detroit, Indianapolis in the Midwest, the so-called Appalachian Redoubt, which is, uh, runs from Western Pennsylvania down to Northern Georgia. Uh, and that's the scene of going back to the 70s, uh, clashes between actual neo-Nazis, uh, militia groups, near the Confederates and far left groups, and then the major cities on, on the East Coast. So that's what I predicted. I didn't really predict it. That's what I analyzed at the end of May, just before the violence broke out. 
Mm -hmm. um, this is where the violence actually happened. So you can see Seattle and Portland um, did happen as major outbreaks. Um, so did the San Francisco area. I called um, Southern California slightly wrong. I thought it was more going to be around San Diego. It was actually mostly in LA County, mm -hmm. um, so slightly further north. The Denver area, um, the, you can see the front range, that sort of row of vertical dots there. Um, Texas, Midwest, Northeast, and then the, the Appalachian area. What I didn't account for, there's more than 200 cities here where we had states of emergency. Um, you know, 23 states had to call out the National Guard. Um, Department of Homeland Security flew predator drones over 15 cities um, during the, during the uh, so-called uprising. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it was much more widespread than, um, in terms of spread than I expected. Uh, but all the areas that I, I predicted did see major, um, major violence. Now, one of the other lessons from insurgency and civil war history is that areas where there's been significant violence in recent times are more prone right. to break out into violence in the future. People get radicalized. Um, they identify enemies. More active radical groups recruit by talent spotting on the street and pull people into more active roles. So I think we can expect this to be a pretty decent map of where some significant violence might happen at the end of the year. And if you wanna think about the scenarios under which that violence might happen, uh, we can talk about that also. Sure. Um, wow. Um, <laughs> the, the, one question I have, David, also you, an amazing stat that again, I think you kind of know intellectually, but the seventies were a much more violent, at least quantitatively. Yeah. yeah. Um, um, was that, is the violence we're seeing now sort of starting to, you know, the way it's been presented in Australian media is it's, there's no, it's not a, an organized group on the left attacking a, an organized group on the right or vice versa. It seems to be yeah. just vandalism, looting, smashing things up. Mm -hmm. um, are you starting to see in any of these data um, organized group versus organized group conflict just yet? Yeah, so, um, yes, I am. So we, we, we've seen different groups at the street thug level squaring off against each other for about five years now. And this conflict has really escalated that level of intensity. So Antifa on the left, um, squaring off with groups like the Patriot Prayer, um, Proud Boys, American Identity Movement, that are call themselves community self-defense militias. They organize and follow basically the same um, approach as the right-wing groups, but with a different ideology. And then at one level above that, you have smaller underground groups that follow a cell-based structure. So that's where the neo-Nazis and some of the neo-Confederate and far-right groups sit on the right-hand side. On the left, it actually starts to become um, a sort of subset of Antifa and then some environmental groups like Earth Liberation Front, um, ALF, the Animal Liberation Front, and a couple of far left um, neo-Marxist terrorist groups. The, so as you go up the pyramid, the groups are smaller, they're more covert, and they tend to be more dangerous or have more dangerous intent. Um, I think we can survive a fairly, um, we can survive a, a, la a small amount of street violence, which has been happening in Portland and Seattle. When it becomes very violent across a very wide area, which we started to see in the last few weeks, that's when groups sort of one step up the pyramid start to organize and come to the fore. So we've seen John Brown gun club members, for example, um, acting as guards with AK-47s in the so-called CHADS, you know, the, yep. the, the zone in Seattle. Yep. Um, we've seen right-wing um, Oath Keepers, which is one mm -hmm. of the equivalent groups and three percenters doing the same thing uh, in the Pacific Northwest and the Appalachian area to guard property against looters. Um, and then I, I would just say on Antifa that, um, again, it's just toxic polarization. On the left, people say it isn't a real thing. It's not a big deal. On the right, people say they're straight up domestic terrorists. Neither of those points of view is true. Um, it's a cell-based organization. Think of it as sort of a combination of the Occupy movement and the anonymous hacking group. Mm -hmm. It has an online presence and a physical presence. 
it has all kinds of organized tactics and you know um, publishes those tactics and shares them and it uses encrypted communications and you know trains people on how to make Molotov cocktails you know it's a real group but it's not the sort of mastermind terrorist group that, that um, President Trump's been painting it as. Hey David in in popular media fictionalized in particular uh, the standard the stereotype of a militia group is right-leaning um, perhaps spilling over into medium level organized crime um, uh, ex-military but but can you give a little bit of a portrait of the sociology if you will yeah of what of what the left looks like i think because okay. we get a presentation i think of of that from the right and a so is that characterization we get from you know uh, through through uh, uh television uh, fictionalized accounts on television of the right but but i think on the left there's far less sort of fictionalization and presentation or stylization of that for 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 an audience particularly an australian audience yeah no that, this is a great point um so on the, the, the picture you painted the right is slightly um, off, right? I don't mm -hmm. know, you, you're, not, you're, not, you're saying that's the mainstream media point of view. And I think the, me, the media does misinterpret the right. Um, uh, there are racist groups on the right and racist groups did feed into the um, militia movement of the 1990s. Uh, and in fact, part of the rise of the militia who claimed to be non-racial and sort of um, constitutionalists rather than right wing was a deliberate attempt to go underground by some of the racist groups that were being targeted after the Oklahoma City bombing. Kathleen Bellew um, did a great book on this called Bring the War Home, uh, where she traces that history. Um, I disagree with a couple of the things, but over, overwhelmingly, it's it's a accurate account based on the data I've seen. Um, so, but there is a racist core that sits behind the militia group. But the vast majority of people that you see interacting with each other in these militia groups are not, in fact, um, consciously um, pursuing a racial agenda. They're more of a sort of uh, libertarian and constitutionalist model. They believe the federal government's out of control, but they don't express that usually in race terms. Um, there are many more groups on the right, about 380, as I said, compared to only 50 on the left. Um, but, you know, again, that's the start state for any conflict. And as we know from history, once a conflict starts, mm. groups will grow on both sides because the violence becomes uh, self-sustaining. On the left, um, the, the, the militia style groups grew out of Antifa and um, trade unionists actually uh, in the, about the middle of the, of the 2000s. So the first groups began to appear about 2006, 2007. Um, the first so-called redneck revolt group um, emerged around the 2008 um, financial crisis. And that actually was a big driver for a lot of radicalization of groups which began to organize initially on the East Coast and then um, pretty heavily in the Pacific Northwest and California. And they became sort of little fully armed, uh, well-organized groups that uh, tried to be a left-wing counterpart of the right militias and to play a protective role over groups in the street. The Ferguson um, protests in 2014 provided a big impetus to the, to the Redneck Revolt and John Brown Doug Clubs, particularly because there was a couple of incidents where Oath Keepers turned up to protect the black protesters against the police, right? Hmm. Indicating what I was saying about not being particularly racist, right? They yeah. were there to... They, they saw themselves as kind of arbiters of um, preventing any violence. Um, that really offended people on the left and they, they stood up these groups to a higher degree. And then of course, the rise of Trump and the election of President Trump saw a huge spike in their activity starting in 2018. So they tend to be regionally based. Um, they tend to have a loose membership that self selects and the activities they do, they do range days, they do um, urban warfare workshops. They do a lot of work on um, uh, border um, protection down in the South. The Phoenix John Brown Club is one of the most active and it actually engages in pretty frequent armed standoffs with the white wing groups down on the border. Mm 
uh, right-wing groups going back to the Ku Klux Klan border watch in the 1970s yeah. and had this sort of tradition of doing vigilante patrols on the southern border. Starting in 2015, the left-wing groups started to confront them and try to protect uh, uh, undocumented immigrants coming across the border. So this, that's an area of standoff. What, that's why I marked that area as a potential area of conflict because they regularly do uh, face off against each other. Um, th these groups are, I'd say, less well organized. They have less military membership or less, sorry, less former, former military membership than on the right. Um, frankly, their weapon skills are not particularly good. Um, and they often get accused by the right wing of uh, LARPing, that is live action role playing. In other words, it's just pretending to be Che Guevara, you know. Um, I think there's a lot of misplaced bravado because um, uh, I, I think they're actually better than the right wing give them, give them credit for and obviously somewhat less good than they, they think them, themselves to be. There are one or two military veterans on the left um, in most groups. On the right, it's probably 25 to 30% RX military. And there's another whole set of people on the right that are you know, people I trained that I worked in unconventional warfare jobs for special forces in Iraq and Afghanistan. They're not the guys running around in camouflage. They're the guys with encrypted radios, um, thinking through plans and uh, coordinating on the dark web with each other. Uh, they're not racist. Um, and in fact, they, I wouldn't consider them to be insurrectionists in a traditional sense. Their theory is the state's gonna collapse and we need to be ready to step into the breach when it does. Um, and that's a pretty interesting choice of phrase because it actually skirts the US definition of insurrection uh, legally and makes them perfectly legal. Um, so not only is what they're doing legal, but they obviously know exactly what the boundary is, um, which to my mind suggests they're, they're pretty dangerous. Well, wow, David. Um... I could keep going like this for a while. Yep. Um, I'm, I'm, it's uh, we're, we're already 40 minutes into our hour. And, and so um, I, I, real quickly, last question from me, because I, I definitely we've got some great questions I want to get to. To what extent is the election in November uh, starting to appear as a motivator in, in internal communications as a rallying point for these groups right now. And, you know, what does that portend about, you know, the words you used earlier about, you know, um, yeah. you know violent electoral cycle? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. So on the left, there is a fairly widespread fear that President Trump will lose the election, but then refuse to step down. Mm -hmm. And that he may actually call in the military to um, stop himself from uh, having to leave. I actually think that's reasonably unlikely, um, uh, but it's a very widespread fantasy on, on the left. On the right, there is a fantasy that the left is going to rig the election, uh, that it's going to result in a, a clean sweep, you know, um, House, Senate, President, many governorships, and that the left will then come after, uh, in a physical, you know, genocidal sense, um, people on the right. Um, and that's equally, I think, overblown. overblown. Um, but if you think about it, right, the, the election has three possible outcomes. Trump wins, Trump loses, or it's unclear, like, you know, 2001 or 2000. 2000, if 2001, Trump, yeah, got it. Yeah. If Trump wins, if Trump wins, I think he steps down, but I think there'll be significant violence of a low grade, you know, baseball bats and bricks, the sort of things we've seen the last few weeks. Um, uh, of, on, of the campaign of the campaign but also in transition right interregnum so wins, yeah okay. sorry what I say, if, if trump loses i think he steps down but there'll be some some violence during the campaign um secondly um you know the right wing will not immediately respond i don't think but when they do it'll be much more lethal than brick, bricks in the street right it'll be it'll be ar-15s um in some groups in some areas i should say if um, uh, if Trump wins, I don't think you're going to get triumphalist violence from the right. You'll get responsive, reactive violence from the left, but it'll be fairly low grade. If Trump loses, you'll get pretty triumphalist political behaviour on the on the left, and then after a delay, you'll get some kind of backlash on the right. Um, so I, you know, and if it's unclear, then I think it's just a very messy transition and potentially that's where the, the most dangerous environment is. And of course, this whole discussion, we haven't really talked about the fact that China, Russia right. and Iran 
all have a very strong interest in ensuring a bad transition in November. Uh, and there's already at least some evidence of, of attempts to interfere, not on the level of Facebook ads like in 2016, but um, sponsoring some of the far right groups and the far left groups, um, money flows, you know, that kind of stuff. Wow. Um, <laughs> let's turn to some questions from, um, from, from participants online. Um, um, Andrew Condon, um, who's affiliated with the RSL here, uh, David, uh, RSL Life Care, uh, asks a great question. Australia needs a stable United States, um, but without interfering in domestic US matters, can Australia do anything to assist the US stabilize itself? I, I, I'm afraid we just really need to watch at the moment um, what's going on in the domestic scene. But as I talked about at the very beginning, one of the big risks here is uh, China-US conflict as both countries start to scapegoat the other. And we've seen an obviously very substantial spike in um, US-China tension in the last few months. I do think we've got a very important role to play there and an important restraining role on the US, but importantly also continuing to stand up to China as we have been doing over the past few months. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, um, you know, the, President Trump, I think, is unlikely to deliberately start a war with China. Um, but I think the posture that US and China are adopting in our part, our neck of the woods, is actually becoming increasingly dangerous in terms of the possibility of miscalculation. And I do think we've got an important role uh, to play there. The other big international uh, issue that we have a role in is the Quad. Um, right. And of course, India and, and China have significant tension right now. So I think we've got a pretty important diplomatic role to play in our region. Um, unfortunately, I, I don't think another power trying to interfere in U.S. Uh, politics w would be would make it any better. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, um, Brenda uh, Brito, and I hope I'm pronouncing your last name correctly, Brenda, a, a student asks, um, this is a great question, David, uh, one for you. What's the difference between an uprising slash insurgency and a social movement slash change movement? Uh, arms, right? I mean, so the definition of, we of, of insurgency that we use is an attempt to exclude or challenge uh, or change a political order using violence, uh, lethal violence, plus political subversion. So what makes the difference? They may have the same objectives, but only when you start to see, you know, actual lethal violence uh, in the service of uh, a non-electoral change of political order that that's when we would start to categorize it as insurgency. Importantly, you, you probably noticed that there's been a bunch of debates about the Insurrection Act in the US. Yes. Um, yes. And insurrection is not the same as insurgency. So that de definition of insurgency that I just gave is the standard military definition. There's a very specific legal meaning of an insurrection in the US and it is um, uh, an organized armed movement attempting to overthrow the constituted government and replace it by force of arms, right? That's defined in US law. And it's quite interesting. If you look at the left groups, they're not really organized enough to be considered an insurrection. If you look at the right groups, they're not calling for the overthrow of the government. Um, so both of them are sort of walking the line. Neither of them could really be defined as an insurrection uh, right now. That, that's great. Thank you um, for that. Um, look, a, a number of questions about, I mean, you've touched on this, but um, I'll, I'll just pick out one that's kind of emblematic of, um, of this set. And this, this comes from Elizabeth German. And, and David, I want to take you back to your remarks about foreign actors. Um, but also, you know, one thing we, we come across in our work at the Centre, David, when we talk about social media as a pernicious factor, that, that, yeah, you've got the foreign actors, but, but plenty of domestic actors are availing themselves of social media. Could you talk a little bit about, you know, what you're seeing there, you know, the balance there and, and what it is that, that, um, that, um, that governments can possibly do um, to, to counter some of that? Yeah. So, or the companies um, themselves, by the way. Yeah. Yeah. So there's obviously a very active debate right now in the States about companies controlling hate speech. Um, this has generally been portrayed as um, uh, 
it's one of these, you know, political Rorschach bots like everything else in the States now, where if you're on the right, you think it's uh, these left-leaning tech companies trying to silence the right. If you're on the left, you tend to think of it as um, uh, people tolerating hate speech and having a short sighted view of, of the risks that come from their platforms. Um, and I think that's, you know, that's going to continue. There's a lot of defunding or de, de um, uh, boycotting of advertising on, on Facebook happening right now. Their shares took a big hit um, in the last couple of days and that's related to this particular issue. Um, the, the way I think of it, you know, you're probably aware that the FBI investigated Russian interference in the 2016 mm -hmm. campaign on Facebook, right? Mm -hmm. And um, the Russians put forward about 66,000 distinct ads targeting different groups, trying to push them in uh, particular directions, uh, not necessarily pro-Trump, more in, in terms of exacerbating existing conflicts among groups. Um, that sounds like a lot. And they spent, you know, several uh, hundred thousand dollars doing that. But, you know, the Brad Pascal, who is the, the mm -hmm. social yep. media director for the Trump campaign, they put out 5.9 million distinct ads. Yeah, right. Right. They spent billions of dollars on Facebook. So the Russian interference, I think, was a drop in, drop in the bucket compared to um, what U.S. political actors were doing. It was much more important what Trump was doing and, and the Clinton campaign wasn't doing on Facebook. Um, rather than um, what the Russians were doing. That's not to say the Russians didn't play a role. The thing that really, uh, the interference that was really significant in 2016 was actually the leaking of the DNC emails, which um, killed the Bernie Sanders campaign, but in such a way as to um, lead to pretty significant disruption and division on the left. So I think that was a Russian activity, as far as we know, um, it, it's debatable. Uh, that had a major effect, but frankly, you know, U.S. political actors don't actually need foreign interference yeah. to do damage to. They, they're doing plenty of damage to themselves as it is. <laughs> Good point. Okay. Um, look, um, I want to. Um, Peter Field from the University of Canterbury in New Zealand. Um, we, we've talked about, you know, in advertising this event, uh, David. We talked a lot about, you know the risk of, um, of violence uh, from, from the groups we've been talking about in the run up to the election. But yeah. Peter asked us to just, or asked you rather, to, to, to perhaps contrast risk of occurrence versus the, the consequence, the, how consequential any, any act of violence might be. And, and, and I'm wondering if you could distinguish that. And again, I, I'm just struck, I keep coming with sort of one of the things that stuck in my head from our chat so far, David, is this reminding us just how prevalent violence was in the United States in the, you know, late sixties through the early seventies, you know, you know, the Cornell universities, it's computer center being blown up. Um, uh, and that just being one of many campuses, um, the Berkeley campus, um, um, I'm just thinking if we could get your assessment of the distinguish between the occurrence versus consequence as, as Peter sort of invites you to do. No, this is a this is a point. Let me let me phrase that slightly differently, right? Uh -huh. um, I think there's a 100% chance that we're going to see some acts of violence in November, right? Um, I think that you know you have to ask the question: At what level does violence or disruption um, start to threaten the fabric of U.S. society and the U.S. state, and then by extension, uh, the U.S. role in the world? And I think if there's a contested outcome and significant violence in the transition period and the US is basically paralyzed and doesn't have a government come 20th of January um, 2021. I think that's a very significant outcome. I think it's probably less than 20% likely right now. Um, if uh, you start to see um, diffuse but significant violence and a major military uh, crackdown as this from a National Guard call out, I think that would also be considered to be, you know, a pretty severe outcome that would likely um, destroy U.S. self-confidence and U.S. role in the world. Uh, again, I think that's slightly more likely, but probably less than 50%. I actually like to think about this differently. I, I have a background in um, strategic intelligence, and there's a thing in intelligence work called I&W, indications and warnings. And 
the way that we structure that is we ask the question, um, why hasn't a civil war in the US already broken out, right? And we look for the factors that are holding it back. So not necessarily the risk factors that I've been pushing forward, but the, the things that are holding it back. And mm -hmm. you can come up with a number of things that are resiliencies that are preventing, um, you know, state collapse right now. Mm -hmm. And I think they're the things that you need to track because as those resiliencies weaken, that, um, you know, indicates increasing risk. You know, doing doing a sort of, total, you know, um, you know, horse racing style um, guesstimate of probabilities. You know, investment banks like to do that, but I, I think in the Intel business, we, we like to be a little more model based. Um, so that's kind of where, where my team is right now. Um, there's a great question here from um, uh, Jim Rogers. Um, and I'll, I'll just read it in its entirety. David notes that the federal narrative has expanded to crowd out local solutions and that local governments may offer a, a way forward, but some local places that you would expect to succeed are already hitting strong resistance. Louisville, Kentucky, and Minnesota are hitting strong resistance on the political economy of policing reform. Jacksonville hosted the GOP convention is struggling uh, with its public health uh, situation. But David, is there a bright spot um, that you would highlight um, in the United States um, at the moment, I guess, in terms of this local solutions, um, uh, perhaps easing, ameliorating um, what might otherwise be a tough situation? Yeah, well, I, I would just say, you know, <clears throat> um, the, the coronavirus is in fact, I mean, it looks extremely scary to sit in Australia and see the data in the US. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's 330 million people uh, Forty-two percent of all deaths so far have been in nursing homes, and the majority of those were in one state, New York. Um, so, if you look at the um, rate of infection, is actually quite high. The level of herd immunity that's developing is probably also quite high. The, you've got a less than one percent chance of, you know, being hospitalised, and uh, even lower chance of dying. So, I think the 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 real threat of the pandemic, which has created a lot of this tension, is actually not as bad necessarily as um, people might think. And there are vast areas of the, of the country where there just aren't very many people affected by it. You can drive through, you know, most of my route driving from Virginia to Montana. <laughs> you you just did, yeah. It's not, yeah. it's not a lot of COVID, you know. Um, it's really the urban um, centers and the, the impact has been largely economic. I also think there's another, um, sort of resiliency here, which is people are not going to go back to a full scale lockdown. Uh, we've already seen significant pushback on that. And I think governments are smart enough to, um, to not push that. There's also developing technology to do with sampling of water systems and so on. That's allowing people to identify the, the virus before the next outbreak happens. Um, I actually have always thought of local policing as a, an important strength in the U S but um, there are two really um, negative things in U.S. policing. One is, I think, called the 1033 program, which has existed since the 1990s, and it distributes. Um, actually, I'm going I'm to add one, three things. Uh, it, it distributes military-grade weaponry and surplus um, armored vehicles and heavy weapons to police departments across the country. Mm -hmm. That's a bad idea, right? I mean, it just leads to this kind of escalatory violence and cops um, turning to the weapon rather than you know, right. talking the guy down as, as happens in Australia more, more often. Um, and I think that one encouraging sign is Congress is looking very strongly at ending that program and possibly returning, uh, you know, to a, a less militarized form of policing. The second problem is uh, I think called civil asset forfeiture. And basically if the right. police suspect you of being a drug trafficker, for example, they can impound your car on suspicion, um, sell that car and use the money to fund their own operations and it can take years to get that asset back even if you're found to be innocent it's been a strong point of contention across the political spectrum um, for a long time but it particularly affects uh, people of color and and, um, and immigrant communities so that's one that's also being looked at as frankly a bit of an abuse um, where you know police departments have a financial incentive in yeah. using people the third one um, 
and again, a little bit different from Australia, there's more than 85,000 police departments in yeah, the US. It's crazy. Yeah. And virtually all of them have a police union. And one of the things that we're seeing in some states now is a move to deunionize the police or to reform the police unions, uh, which have basically become a racket for protecting bad officers. And, um, you know, the, probably the shining example of that is the city of Camden, which is sometimes misunderstood as having disbanded its police. It didn't actually disband its police. It dissolved the police, including the union, and then created a brand new non-unionized police uh, structure with different standards and different people. Um, so it basically declared the police bankrupt and started a new one. Didn't get rid of the police. It created a whole new system. Um, so, you know, I think there are, there is some hope as we're starting to see moves that will reform that uh, to some extent. But again, like once the grievance leads to this degree of widespread violence, solving the original grievance is only part of the uh, answer. There's a, a lot of angst out there now that, that isn't going to go away just because, you know, moves get taken to, um, to re remedy some of the underlying issues. Hey, um, we're almost out of time. This is probably going to be the last question, but I, I, I just, so many have come in as we've been chatting, David, is a great sign of a really en engaging webinar. But um, Alexandra Phelan, um, I really want to get to her question. She says, um, to what degree do you feel cell structure and loose membership contributes to fragmentation on the far left, particularly in terms of organized militancy? She says, we found from some of our own research here in Australia that there are significant ideological divides that are causing severe internal divisions among some groups that affiliate with Antifa, um, albeit a quote, common enemy vis-a-vis, -vis, although I guess, albeit they have a common enemy vis-a-vis -vis the, the, the far right. Um, yeah, um, great point. I actually have spent a lot of time looking at this. It's probably a much longer yeah, uh, sorry, seconds, yeah. Yes, there's a lot of different factions. They usually don't cooperate unless there is a uh, common enemy. They've evolved a system of what they call affinity groups and clusters that allow groups that don't necessarily agree on everything to cooperate tactically on the ground. They also have a backbone of encrypted tactical communications that is helping them uh, through software to find radios and so on to organize. On the right also there's a very similar cell based structure and actually there's a lot of cross pollination. The left wing groups are actually copying an older right wing technique called leaderless resistance that was invented in uh, the right wing groups in the racist movement in the 1980s and then has spread to the left. On the right they don't have such a sol solid grasp of um, uh, tactical communications but they do have a much better national network, which runs on HF radio through a thing called the AMRON, the American Redoubt Radio Operators Network, which is a right wing militia based HF network. And they have regular, you know, Saturday evening, what we call SCEDs, where everyone gets on the HF and talks in, in code about what's going on, uh, whereas the left are more online and in the, in the deep web. Um, but one of the strongest trends I'm seeing is actually co-evolution where left-wing groups and right-wing groups are starting to develop equivalent governing and military structures hmm. and are increasingly resembling each other, even though their ideology is completely different. And this is a classic, um, my book that I, I published a, about a week into the COVID crisis, I talk a lot about um, co-evolution in these kind of conflicts. Didn't think I'd end up seeing it directly in the US, but it's certainly been a feature of what we've seen. Wow. Um... David, we could go for another hour easily. There's, there's so many great questions here that we haven't got to. And as I said, they're, they're piling in um, late, late in the webinar. So no, no chance of getting to them. Um, but, but let me, let me commend uh, people to the, to the book uh, that we, you, ju you just referenced. Um, I think we had that up on a, on a slide a little bit earlier. There it is. Thank you, Janine. Um, <laughs> Um, do want to do want to uh, plug the book? Um, um, it's very interesting. Our conversation today is about internal to the United States, but the point is that you know it's it's quite chilling actually. That the the categories and methodologies uh, and lessons learned from David's long work uh, 
uh, analyzing counterinsurgency and civil unrest and and uh, uh, escalatory spirals of violence and organization of, of these sorts of groups. So many of that, those lessons in the methodology is, is, is being deployed or can be deployed and probably should be deployed, as David points out, to uh, our understanding of, of what's happening in the United States right now, which is, on the one hand, you know, chilling, frankly, but, but I think really important work. And, and the last thing to, to say, David, is just, again, this is the, the we just spoke to Jonathan Swan um, last week. It's just terrific to hear an Australian accent <laughs> in a position such as yours, so knowledgeable um, about what's going on in the United States. And, and again, I don't think a, a few, I think quite a few Australians understand the career you've had, but, but more should. Um, um, the contribution you made and, and, the, and the, uh, to, to to the United States uh, and and to the alliance more broadly and and to the to the to the to the causes we have in common between the two countries, um, few few Australians have a career like yours. So, you know, on behalf of two two countries, thank you, and uh, I'm a dual citizen, so thank you, thank you. Um, but but just terrific to have someone like you, David, um, you know, the directory you've had, being able to share um, again this this. Not, not just the insights, but, but just the data richness. Um, I think, I hope everybody appreciated that. Um, um, very close to the ground and, and close to the facts. And, and, and that's the way we like to roll too at the United States Study Center. Thanks, David. Please go to our website there. You can see all the events uh, coming. Plenty more where that came from. I'm, I'm just so thrilled with A, the audience size as we're pulling to these events. And, and, and the caliber of the people that are willing to give us their time from the United States. It's, it's terrific. David, um, again, this hour we have with him, uh, Exhibit A for that. So thank you, everybody. Thanks again to David. Thanks to the team in Sydney. And we'll see you on Friday for our discussion with Mia. Cheers. Thanks, David. Thank you.